why PMs fail. So here's a handful of reasons. There's there's a lot more than this, but this is just the general vision. Um, number one, the lack of vision. You don't know what it is you want and you cannot clearly define it. Number two, failure to train and partner. Uh, by partnering, it's with other departments, other organizations, other contractors, vendors, scheduling. Um, three, it's not a diet. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's very common to to hear a lot of people say, oh, we're going to start our preventative maintenance program this week, next week, next month, whatever it may be. And it's just like a diet. It's, it has to be a way of life. It is not just, I'm going to eat well now to lose some weight. No, I'm going to eat this way forever and maintain a healthy lifestyle. So and the same is true with the preventative maintenance program. It's, it's not something that people set up for and then break down and then go back to, to work. Uh, it, it should be something that is continually in your active role as a facility manager. It should be just a way of the lifestyle. Um, trying to apply PM to anything and everything. Not everything has a preventative maintenance program. Not everything needs a preventative maintenance program. Number four, PMs are vague. You'll see so many times in these handbooks that say, check the motor or the PM has been just copied and pasted from one piece to another. Um, so it, it's just vagueness, vague, vague direction gives vague results. And you just have to be very specific in what it is you're looking for. Um, the PM interval is not correct, is not the correct frequency. So there's a, a common term we'll get into here in a minute that just says uh, MTBF, which stands for not just before the mean time between failure uh, so the PM intervals are done at the right at the wrong time, after failure, too often or too late. Uh, so making sure that you, you inject your PM program the correct intervals is, is key. Uh, the PM doesn't appear to be important. A lot of times, making sure that all parties involved know the, the emphasis of a PM program. Uh, PM data is not recorded. PNs are pencil whipped and there's a lack of accountability. PMs are not completed when due. Uh, anyone is allowed to add a PM. So you have to have specific people that are designated in order to uh, have a successful program uh, that know how to write SOPs, that know how to implement training, that know what machines need specific, um, that know what the machines need specific uh, intervals, what they're their practices are, so on and so forth, uh, and that you didn't roll it out correctly. So maybe you didn't build it up correctly. Maybe you didn't get the right parties involved. Uh, and then lastly, you haven't inspired your team. There's a part in here where we'll go into that says, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results is known as insanity, right? Well, how do you get your team to do the same thing over and over again? hoping for the same results in terms of the equipment or rooms or standards, whatever you have set forth. How do you guarantee that they have the same consistency and still keep them inspired about it? So with that being said, we'll keep moving forward. Uh, understanding the different types of maintenance. So the first type of maintenance that people are aware of is corrective maintenance. So the corrective maintenance is a, a set of tasks that's this, that's destined to correct the defects. Sorry about that. Destined to correct the defects to be found in the different equipment and that are communicated to the maintenance department by the users of the same equipment. So this is also known as breakdown maintenance. Preventative maintenance. Uh, its its main mission is really to maintain the level of certain service on equipment, programming inventions of their vulnerabilities at the most opportune. It's is a systematic character that is the equipment is inspected even if it has not given a symptom of a problem so whether or not it's it's showing any indication of wear and tear you still are going to check it to make sure that it's operating or in a certain standard that you're looking for three predictive maintenance um it's it's a long one here so i apologize but its, its main pursuit is to constantly know and report the status and operational capacity uh, of installations by knowing the values of certain variables, which represent such a state and operational ability. To apply this maintenance, it's necessary to identify the physical, 
variables, temperature, vibration, power, consumption, et cetera, uh, which variation is indic indicative of problems that may be appearing on the equipment. So this maintenance is actually the most technical and requires advanced technical resources. Um, a great example would be, let's say you're, you're going through doing load balancing or perhaps performing a, uh, a, a, uh, like a heat analysis on your, your sub panels or your switch gear, or you're doing a coordination study where you need to pull off, you know, dead fronts, you need to amp out things, you need to take a thermal heat gun, you know, what, so on and so forth. Zero hours maintenance. Um, this is the, we're a set of tasks whose goals is to review the equipment at a schedule interview. So without kind of going, uh, it's basically saying at a thousand hours, whether this is functioning or not, we're going to treat it as though it needs to be replaced. Whether that be a, a pump, a motor, um, a, a light bulb, wh whatever you're going to be working on, you want to ensure that whether at that thousandth hour or not, if it's still functioning, fantastic, but you're still going to change it out in anticipation of it going bad at any moment. Periodic maintenance, so time-based maintenance. This is probably the most common, and it's also the most basic that has elementary tasks. So this is something that you would assign some entry-level tasks to do that you don't have to have training. Uh, the example I would use would be an air filter. So time-based maintenance would be at three months, you're gonna go into each specific area, air handler, room, wherever, and you're gonna change out the, the air filter in that specific fan coil. And that's it's solely based off of time, not condition. There's also legal maintenance. A lot of people forget that a lot of the equipment we work on is subjected to rules and regulations by certain governmental administrations. And above all, we we want to ensure that we're not placing an excess amount of liability on on ourselves, on our staff, and we want to ensure that we're also. Uh, guaranteeing the safety of, of patrons or associates or guests that are going to be using specific equipment. Uh, a great idea might be uh, your fire suppression system, perhaps your life safety, uh, tag outs, your elevators. There, there's a handful of different uh, examples that you can give, but typically the ones below listed below are equipment and devices under pressure. So it, it could be if you don't have anyone on your team that's uh, EPA certified that's going to be working on coolers, chillers, whatnot. Installation of high and medium voltage, cooling towers, right? Legionelle is a big thing, and uh, everyone's concerned about that as of late. But uh, you you want to make sure that you're you're giving the contracted work specifically to people that are certified to do a lot of that. Not just because it's the right thing to do. Uh, if if people find out, they would be upset at you, but because it's the right thing to do for the right reasons. It's it's something that is morally and ethically guiding, should be guiding your, your, your moral compass. Uh, subcontracted maintenance to a specialist. Uh, you know, when we talk about specialists, we refer to individuals or companies that, that have a particular uh, specialization in that equipment. They may be the manufacturer, they could be their technical service, or just a, a company that's been a rep for them for a very long time. Um, and the, the best time to turn to a specialist is when you either don't have all of the knowledge or perhaps you don't have all the necessary resources in order to perform the work. So if there are any of these circumstances, uh, most of the maintenance you should probably outsource to those companies. Now, the subcontracted maintenance is obviously the most expensive and their, their prices are not market prices. They're, they're frankly monopoly. And they know it, which is why if you're calling a, a service tech to come out and work on your your elevator, this and Krupp, who builds after two hours worth of work, I think most of the time you think it would have been cheaper to have your, your credit card stolen than to have them come out. But nonetheless, um, if, if there are ways you can avoid avoid having them come out by developing a training plan, a lot of these third-party vendors are willing to to partner up with you and ensure that if there's anything you can do to to come out and avoid some nuisance calls, they're more than willing to help most of the time if you develop solid relationships with them um, and help offset any nuisance calls because it's not fun for them to, to drive out as well if it's something simple that can be resolved safely. Uh, 
So on to, um, I'll just make sure nobody has any questions. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything in here, but I can answer anything at, at the meantime. I'll, I'll keep going if not. But hopefully over here people can see. Uh, we can get to that in a moment. Okay, no questions. So back to this. I apologize. Present. Sorry about that. So objectives of your PM program. The main objectives of your PM program, number one, in my opinion, to have the top management understand the true cost of poor maintenance, which is several times the initial estimate, right? And we'll get into this later, but it's very difficult to convince top management. Now that can be your board of directors, your chief, I'm sorry, the board of directors, your HOA president, your general manager, director of operations, whoever it might be, to convince them that you need to spend money now with everything operating at its peak condition, essentially, with really no sustained issues or any additional problems, but you still need more money, uh, which we can get into a minute, into in a minute. Um, sustained management, leadership, and absolute commitment. The, the biggest problem I've all, one of the other problems I've had has been ensuring that additional key members of management, the department heads that are indirectly involved with preventative maintenance programs stay committed. It's it's just been, I've had so many experiences in the past where you, you go to occupy a specific room or an area that you need shut down for something and only to come find out that the other manager had forgot about it and hadn't either placed a room on block, placed an area on block, notified his supervisors, his staff members. Let's say you're painting, doing a PM of your, your parking garage where you need to restripe it, but yet... Uh, they didn't tell the bell staff or the overnight staff that no one can park there. So next thing you know, uh, the cars are still full there. Your team shows up or your subcontractor shows up to do the work, and yet they're unable to do it. It's very frustrating. Um, number three, knowledge of equipment, processes, conditions required to, to yield quality output, uh, safety, and compliance standards. So this one's pretty straightforward. You, you want to make sure that you have a very thorough understanding of the environment that you're going into, the current conditions, and then what your main objectives are. Uh, and some of those, of course, are quality, output, safety, and then just general compliance standards, which kind of leads into the next one that nobody can determine what problems exist, exist until you know what conditions are present, right? It's, again, making sure that you have a, a solid feedback loop from yourself, your team, uh, anyone involved that you can actually identify the current uh, current conditions in a specific area. Um, predictive preventative maintenance, another program maintenance, it, it has to be a normal part of the schedule and its capacity determination. Uh, management must ensure that it's never delayed. Again, kind of going back into number one, you can't harp on this enough with the team and there, there has to be a decisive course of action if somebody on another team drops the ball in terms of uh, delaying or preventing the program from happening because it's integral and it just has to happen. There's no other way. Um, what you'll need to develop a PM program, we'll get into that. And then how to inspire your team and the common pitfalls. Like I mentioned earlier, you're, you're trying to motivate a, a group of, of individuals that are going to be doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the exact same results. So not even expecting different ones, but they know that they're going into a specific space and they know the condition has to come out a certain way. So the five essential requirements of your uh, PM program, um, top management leadership and absolute commitment. Who do you need to get involved? Your front desk, your operations, your housekeeping, which department is integral to, to, the, key of, to the key successes of your preventative maintenance program? Um, every department head needs to be present during your initial meetings. Uh, you have to continue to schedule meetings so that no issues arise. Um, uh, the example I have typed in here is we had a specific bank of rooms that we were going to be doing preventative maintenance on. So this was going to be a comprehensive preventative maintenance program. Everybody had the list. Everybody had the plan. Everyone was at the meeting. Yet each day when we show up in the morning to, to follow the schedule, 
the entire program had changed. It was, nope, you're no longer doing this area, you're doing this area. And I cannot tell you how frustrating that was and demoralizing that was for the team. Uh, it, it's as as your as their manager, your goal is obviously to to wear a, a very stern face and not be affected by a lot of these things. But after it happens the third, fourth, and fifth time, it it wears on you as well, and they they can read it on you. Your team can read it. So making sure that top management really understands and emphasizes that um, compliance and discipline. I kind of already talked about this. Um, Process operators should be involved to perform daily maintenance checks, documentation, follow-up, and workloads. This is a key part of the feedback loop. So when your team does go do the work, who's following up after them? Are they doing it to the standards that you ensure? It's, it's a, not enough to create a checklist that people can go inspect if you're not willing to inspect what you're expecting. Because the feedback loop I've had so many times where people have said, oh, did you did you perform this equipment? Yeah, I did this. I did that. Did you follow the checklist? And it's frustrating because people will sign their initials next to things uh, claiming that they've done it, which I still can't understand who would sign their name complete when you're physically going to walk it with them after. And it's not complete, but that still happens. So ensuring that you you close the feedback loop to ensure that they have the parts, the materials, tools, uh, they understand the processes, the training, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and again, another emphasis of the, the true cost of poor maintenance, which is several times the initial estimates, has to be understood. And then number five, uh, a good preventative maintenance practice must be instituted immediately. I mean, there you cannot wait at all to begin doing PMs on things. It just, it has to be instituted. Um, skip to the next one. So getting top management buy-in, how do you do it? Uh, how do you talk their language? I mean, it's, it's difficult. So one of the first questions I ask myself when giving presentations and whatnot, technical is my boss, as an example. And don't get me wrong, the, the people above us, the GMs, the, maybe the corporate directors, regional managers, uh, I'm, I'm sure that they're all very intelligent people, but you kind of, get in your life what becomes salient, right? And if it's no longer relevant to them, they kind of lose sight of, of certain things. So the question is, uh, how technical are they? And can, could they really diagnose an issue with a walk-in cooler as an example? So when it comes to regards to your PM pitch uh, or your, your PM in general, you have to make sure that you're, you're talking in a language that they understand, um, which I'll go now to... Uh, to this, and this applies towards um, uh, your 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 HOA managers, your board presidents, GMs, anybody. So, this was a letter that was written for the board president. It was meant to be sent out to uh, to everyone on the board. There were about. I think 81 individual homeowners that used their and we were noticing that as we went into their residences they were although brand new very expensive and nice uh they were still being main they, they needed to be and we couldn't convince them to do it so we had to to write i had to write a preventative maintenance program pitch essentially and in this whole thing, which I'm happy to, to email anybody at, at the end of this, if they're interested, it, it really is somewhat of a dissertation. And it would explain that, hey, here's our climate. We're at 8,300 feet. We have very difficult uh, you know, programs that fully encompass all of the work we're looking to accomplish within a specific set of time. Ultimately, if you expect us to come into your home and in one week, be able to repair a year's worth of damage, you're unfortunately mistaken. From here, kind of went down to discuss uh, what preventing the maintenance can save. Hey, you know, what I mentioned earlier, talking their language. People want to know the what's in it for me and how much am I going to save? How much is this going to cost? 
So the idea was uh, we'd go through and we'd, I'd write this, write this email, send everything out. And the example I gave was, <laughs> it might be a bad one, but an individual buys a dishwasher. The manufacturer uh, informs the buyer that the typical useful life of a dishwasher is, is eight years. Just before eight years, the individual decides to replace the dishwasher with a new one. Uh, there's an example of predictive maintenance. And I gave them three additional examples, how to budget for it. Uh, I, I took a source from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the, the typical uh, homeowner budget that someone would need to uh, set aside in order to maintain their, their property. So these homes, as an example, went for about, um, let's say, $4 million, right? So this example obviously is that's right, $34 million. Um, keeps going. So I, I, I went down and I said, look, the average home size, the average uh, price per square foot, and kind of just did a summary of the example. So 1% of the, the home's value, this is what you would anticipate doing it. I sent it out to them. And honestly, everybody bought into the program after sending it to them. There was a couple other presentations that I showed them that, that I'll show you as well. Uh, what top management really cares about? What's it going to cost me, like I mentioned? Uh, what's in it for the property? A reduction of X amount of complaints, breakdowns. Oops, missed an end there. Uh, who's this going to impact? And how will this impact me? Which essentially made me have to create another PM presentation. So this one, I think everybody can appreciate, uh, something that I sat down this is an abridged version because I know everybody's limited on time. But I took, I took the property. Here was the property. Beautiful area. Beautiful hotel. Mixed-use residence. Uh, and this was a presentation I gave in front of everyone. And again, this is the abridged version. So uh, just trying for brevity here. The, the objective of the PM program, provide a detailed preventative maintenance service once a year that returns each residence that participates in our rental program to as new condition through the work of a dedicated preventative maintenance team. That's the goal. Benefits. Um, we wanted to reduce MOD logs re related to room condition. Now, MOD stood for, for those who may not be familiar with this industry, manager on duty. The benefits uh, were also to maintain rate integrity. I think our average daily rate in this specific property was I want to say $1,200 a night, so it's very expensive. Uh, and in order to maintain that rate integrity, people had high expectations. And this was some of the data that I pulled that it was pretty limited in that respect. So this is very skewed. And I apologize, I don't know why this, uh, this graph is so poor. But we had 4,500 guest calls reported, uh, which averaged about 12 and a half per day. And out of those, it says room call engineer. They had them very basic. Uh, you can see the largest one is lamp changing. I'm not sure what this one is. General maintenance, I believe, which is a, a category that I hate. So our main goals were really to reduce the, the main calls that were coming in. I gave a, a brief scope of work. Here's what we're going to be cleaning. Here's what we're going to be maintaining. Sorry, and you know, we, I had a whole other list off to the right over here that, that gave everybody an example of uh, what it was we were going to be doing. Uh, productivity. So this one has an example because they like everybody likes to know what's my return on investment. We had 173 rooms. We would we actually broke them down between suites, so we, we broke it down a little bit farther. Further, um, we narrowed into bays, and we would focused. Uh, we would focus more on a forecast that would be easily quantifiable. So the example uh, would be consider we would a specific room. Number one, one, one would be a two bay room, right? So if we had 66 suites, which I believe was the correct number, equaled 132 bays. We had 107 standard, 107 standard bays or standard rooms. So our cumulative total was 239 bays. And in order to do all the work, it would take approximately 10 months to complete 239 bays, which leaves us with four weeks after factoring in holidays, blackout dates of, if you wanted to call it free time, which wasn't accurate. 
logistics. So here's how we laid it out. Again, everyone in this room was upper management because we needed to, to get the point across that everybody has to be a part of it. And whether it's you're the food and beverage director or a front office manager, we needed you to understand the logistics and the importance of it. This was a typical, typical sample. On our first day, we would place the room out of order after the guest departs. After that, the room attendant would come clean the room uh, from 2.30 to 11. Uh, with maintenance would be in there doing a specific checklist, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, day two, from 6 a.m. to 2.30, they would repaint the entire room from 2.30 to 11. Housekeeping would go back in, deep clean, reset. Day three, we'd walk through, do a punch list. If there was anything else, they'd complete their final clean. Um, responsibilities. This is where you would put in everything you needed from everybody in that room. And this would not necessarily be a static document. So you would actually want to go over everything with everyone in the room and, and add additional responsibilities at that time. So great example was we'd say, okay, we're going to map out the out of order schedule for the year with our residential manager, hotel manager, housekeeping and engineering. We're going to have a weekly review of our out of order block to accommodate guests. And those were two individuals in the room, final inspection, who is going to be doing that and then identify or hire the PM team with housekeeping and engineering. So the cost, I needed some additional input, but I anticipated at $15 an hour plus benefits equated to $77,000. One full-time housekeeper, $13 an hour plus benefits, $33K, totaling just over $100,000. And then here was the part that really got everybody excited because all of the work we do in most of our set in this particular setting was... Uh, billable. So not only were we able to hire associates, but we were able to track their time, document their time, and then charge a greater amount for their uh, services than we were actually charging, being you know paying for on our P and Ls um, in house. So our entire recapture was somewhere around two hundred fifty eight k. And after our labor, which we, we took our housekeeper and our, our two engineers, it was 110. So we actually would, would profit on this, uh, kind of ironic. And of course, we would also buy all of the tools, all of the materials, um, which it's not going to equal 100, $110,000 uh, to, to get up to that. I'm sorry, it's not 110. It's uh, just over 100 and looks like 140, $130,000 net profit approximately. So... Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a no brainer. And when people saw this and when, when you show your, your boards of directors and, or anyone else involved that your program is a net zero, ultimately a net gain through your services, uh, everybody gets excited about that. No one isn't looking anyone is looking for, uh, an additional, uh, revenue stream. Um, recapture. So we had to go over a couple things, but th that was generally that was generally that. And then here was some uh, some citing of the specific examples in HOA CCNRs that we could reference and say, look, you know, maintenance and repair. Here's this. Here's that. So it wasn't just can we recapture? It, it was a factual thing. Okay, so that's how you, that's one way to get top management buy-in. Because again, what do they care about? What's it going to cost? What's in it for me? What's in it for the property? How much is this going to reduce? Uh, who's this going to impact? Uh, and then lastly, I have on here, have it, have them place it in your GL. Uh, have them place a GL in your p and L statements. So something that I have always found interesting is when you go through your GLs, your p and Ls, I'm sorry, that I don't know that I've ever seen a preventative maintenance line item. Um, I think I have around 75 my particular, and that ranges from, of course, you know, HVAC to uh, and, you know, whether that's employee education or training and, and it runs the gamut, but I, I'm, I'm positive that I don't have a preventative maintenance, uh, line item in that budget. So I always thought that was interesting, right? I mean, if you can get your controller, your property controller, your accounting department to, um, 
to put something in your P&Ls and make it official and establish a budget, which we can talk about a totally separate time. That there's There are ways to do that. Uh, I think that would be fantastic because it, it just solidifies your PM program even more, which I think is great. Um, the next we talked about in discipline. So taking advantage of your CMMS. Uh, I'm not sure what a lot of you use. I've used homegrown pro programs and processes that were developed by by the companies themselves. I've used uh, Maintenance Connection. I've used um, uh, a handful of different ones, Managers Plus. There's Hot Sauce. There's a lot of different ones. So in terms of discipline, there's, there's a lot of data to grab. Uh, from a PM checklist, uh, in terms of compliance, this was something that I had written for an owner. Again, not necessarily for us to base our our actual work off of, but I needed to give them a visual representation of what their PM program would entitle. So at the top, you'll see January, February, March, etc. And then I'll put a specific area. So this home. This gentleman's home was, was a large house, and here was his master bedroom as an example. So in, in, your, in your master bedroom, what do we need to do? Now, I got a lot more granular than what's here. Like I was saying, this was simply something that I could visually give to, to this owner so that he could comprehend what exactly was involved. So fireplace, test all components. This is what is his bedroom. Regrow the tile around the fireplace. I would do this, what I call BAS, before, after season. Operation. Didn't need to happen all the time, every three months. Inspect paper, wallpaper for peeling. Well, this was, his entire home was, was wallpaper, and when you have a fireplace in certain areas and lots of corners, uh, even the best wallpaper uh, over time with, with windows and lighting and heat and temperatures in this climate uh, had a tendency to to kind of walk away from the walls a little bit. So same thing, you can kind of get the idea, operate sliding door, lubricate, lighting for proper, lighting and outlets for proper operation uh, in your closet, in your bathroom. Uh, it just kept going down, down, here's your living room. Here's the, what we need to do, monthly, weekly, daily, if anything. And then what I did over on the right side, was I said, look, Mr. Resident, Here's what we've anticipated. You have 19 items that require monthly service, 65 items that require quarterly, 11 that require semi-annual, and two that are annual. And we went through on a separate form, which it's not showing down here on the second tab, that said, okay, here's what we anticipate spending monthly, here's what we anticipate spending quarterly, here are, here's what we anticipate spending semi-annually, um, and gave them a total. So we said, look, in order to maintain your residence for, uh, in this condition, based off of these service records, we anticipate spending 342 hours, right? And this, as an example, was $19, right? Which we're not, nobody charges $19. That was just a, a, maybe a break even after we're paying a, a technician a certain, certain wage plus benefits. But if we were able to come up with a, a compromise, and what's great about this is uh, most of these owners are very, very understanding to say, look, if I hire a, a contractor, a subcontractor, you know, their rates are going to be outrageous. So we came up with something like $35, right? So now I'd say, okay, Mr. Owner, I need $11,970 in order to, make, to, to perform the preventative maintenance on your residence. Is that something you're interested in? And surprisingly, just because they had the discretionary, inter uh, discretionary income, everybody said yes. But uh, on a separate note, we can turn um, the comprehensive program, right? I, I found that over time, it doesn't matter who it is, owners, again, managers, general managers, so on and so forth, really hate being nickeled and dimed. So they want you to come up with a comp comprehensive price that they can pay one time, that they can either amortize over their P&Ls uh, over the year, monthly, however it is, instead of, hey, this month I need 500, this month I need 1,000, this month I need 250, this month, I, need, I mean, it just gets so old, um, and they want you to come up with a comprehensive package. So 
even if this number came up a little high, and again, it was negotiable because my intent was not necessarily to make money for the company I was working with. It was merely to offset the labor of the specific individual performing the work and then ensure that we were maintaining the specific home or area or residence um, standard. So that was, that was really the intent. And if he whittled me down on price, uh, what it was but any of the money we did generate we would just fund directly back into our department which we were able to create a lot of additional line items and, and buy a lot of great things for the property so it it wasn't um it paid in vain i mean nobody aside from the company and and him as a homeowner actually benefited from it so if i got 50 homeowners all giving me ten thousand dollars well the fantastic news is it, it doesn't line anybody's pocket but it certainly enhances the the property to a level that is noticeable by everybody. So that's the PM checklist. Um, there's an old phrase that says, with persistence, you'll get it. With consistency, you'll keep it. So just back to the beginning where be persistent in, in, in starting a program and then be consistent and you're going to maintain it. Um, like we've talked about it, I feel like I've said it a thousand times and I apologize, but you have to have unwavering support and communication with, with all the parties involved. And they can't have excuses. And you program a month early to do a mock trial of it and, and test fire to see how it works, then that's what you're going to have to do. But you, you cannot waver from your preventative maintenance program. Daily maintenance, as, as mentioned in the top five. Daily maintenance checks, follow up on workloads, and the feedback loop. And what you're expecting. Are you following up? Uh, I think I may have given one example, but I, I actually gave one gentleman on my team years ago a a preventive. He went through it for a couple weeks, said he was performing all these things. I followed up, uh, said, let's go check out some of the areas you've been working in. He said, sure. I took his, his forms that he had signed. Uh, we went into an area, pulled out the filter. He hadn't changed it. And I said, okay, you know, this guy's busy. Maybe he just missed it. I said, let's go check another one. I checked another one with him. He missed it. He didn't do it, but he said he did. Third one, I said, okay, well, you know what? He's done a thousand of these filter changes. Maybe he really did miss two. Go to check a third one. He missed it. It just, the, the, the pattern continued, and ultimately he just was lying and didn't perform any of them, uh, but said he was, and he, he was pencil whipping. So the feedback loop is, is, is critical. Um, how are the teams performing the work? Uh, is it up to standards? So inspecting again, uh, do you need to correct anything? Are they doing it the way that, that you're looking to have it done? Uh, what, what needs adjusted? What conditions are present with the equipment? So is what you anticipated actually the case? Are they better? Is it worse? Uh, do you need additional supplies? Do you need additional resources? Do you need something else? Uh, what is it that you, your teams are finding when they're there? Uh, next, how are your, you and your supervisors correcting their deficiencies? So people are always going to have problems. They're, they're not going to do it the way that you want, even though you tell them a thousand times that you need it done a specific way. So how are you coaching? How are you mentoring? Are you presenting it in a way that they're understanding it? Um, and are they, are they getting better at it? Uh, what's your PM's team? What is your PM team feedback? Uh, do they need additional parts, tools? How are they working with other departments? Are they supportive? Are you moving along at the right pace? Can you forecast your, your PM work? Um, so on and so forth. It's expensive being cheap. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a lot of people, again, still have the adage that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We've already kind of gone over getting top management buy-in. I, I feel like um, we've gone over that pretty well. They, they like to talk in numbers, and they want to know what's called the WIFM. What's in it for me? <laughs> Another strategy or tactic you can use is to, to give them an offer. They want to know what it would cost if something goes down. So again, back to the hotel example. If your room's cost is a $500 average daily rate, uh, if that room goes down, that's $500 a day. If you have 100% occupancy and 100 people complain about uh, a heating or cooling issue in the in the area during a peak season, and they all complain for a, 
a 50% refund, what's that going to cost you? Are they, is it 20,000 a day, 30,000 a day? Um, so people like logic and reason when it comes to that. And, and I've found that upper management responds very well to talking in numbers. All this is, is essentially more of the same what we talked about. Uh, I realize you guys have been with me for about 40 minutes. Those of you who are still here, which is three of us. So keep going. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, let's see, where was it? I apologize. Uh, next is, again, this is just the expensive being cheap portion of it. So if you did a 20% budget cut, what would the repercussions be? You can't take on new staff. You can't recruit a new office manager, as an example. You have an increased low workload, and you have lower productivity. If you have a 20% budget cut, you have no external training, fewer new skills, problems with morale, more internal training, and you know some, some skill sharing. So there's a, a big spider web of things that can happen. Um, so... Inspiring your team. This is definitely the hardest part. Again, doing the same thing over and over again, but getting the same result is known as what? I think it's known as preventative maintenance because you want the same results all the time. So how do you keep your team inspired? Um, in the past, what I've done, have I've broken up all of their task loads. So instead of giving one person an entire list to complete in a specific area, I would simply divide it into lesser workloads in specific categories. So HVAC, painting, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and then I would do a rotation of duties. I would say, okay, this week you're doing HVAC. And again, this is, we're not talking pulling apart scroll compressors and rebuilding head gaskets or, or whatever it might be. It's, it's, it's PM basic work. Uh, and it's mixing up the monotony of things so that they, they can – stay sharp and feel like they're learning and not feel overwhelmed by certain things. So uh, I've also learned that asking people to multitask is simply asking them to do many things poorly at the same time. Uh, I've also instituted a prize wheel. So we put a wheel on the wall. We do kind of a team member of the week. And at that, we put really cool prizes on the, on the wheel. We've done everything from gift cards to restaurants to a new pair of boots to a, some weeks we put a paid day off on there. Um, minutes early, get an extra hour lunch, just just a lot of different things. Uh, also, at the beginning of some of these things, we've done new tools, new boots, specific jackets uh, for specific PM areas. And then uh, is during your, your one-on-ones with team members or your one-on-ones with your managers who are having one-on-ones with your staff, uh, you know, really finding out what the associates' interests are and making sure that you're tailoring the needs of of whatever it is that mo inspires them um, to the rewards that you're going to be giving them. And then lastly, uh, I've also offered the team the ability to help create SOPs, pages that were essentially memorialize their, their hard work. And, and a great example would be this PM handbook. So if anybody wants a copy of this, again, all these things I'm happy to share, just let me know. Um, we put a PM handbook together. Right. And we said, look, here's the handbook. It's designed to provide a, a useful guide to prevent the maintenance procedures uh, in our resort slash hotel. And we, we just went over the basic things that we would cover, would ask certain people if they would want to write maybe the air handler PM. And I put their name at the bottom of it and say this SOP had been written by, let's say, Bruno, as an example. And then we would have them all write a little handbook. We distribute it to the team, and everybody has a little sense of pride when they get to see their own work handed out and not eternalized, but certainly going to be with the, the specific area for a long time. This is just a continued version of it. We would write uh, how to do an HVAC cleaning, right? What tools you need, the detailed instructions, annually, what needed to happen. And then we'd put their name at the bottom of it if they'd written it. And this was just something that we would consistently revise. Absolutely. How do you customize? So most of you, if you're like me, have inherited a facility with little to no PM, or it's not a very robust one. Robust one. Uh, what do you do? Well, you begin to gather data in the form of reserve studies, CMMS, hot sauce, 
if they're handwritten, you take the handwritten ones, you compile something out of it, you become a data scientist and you understand what it is that the systemic issues on your property are, where your failure points have been, and where you need improvement. Then uh, you begin to gather physical data. This is a hard one where you have to send your, your staff out, and then this is a long process where they gather the make, the model, the serials, the fixtures, the quantities, bulb types, uh, oil types, does it have a zert fitting? I mean, all the specific details on the physical data of the equipment that you're servicing. Um, an itemized PM for them based off of the, the data that you have, both physical and, um, you know, in the, from the computer. So an itemized thing uh, that we did, and we broke it down even further, this was a specific uh, room, and we had SOPs. This took a long time for every single one of the aspects that you see on this itemized PM. So if the beginning was do entry, door, and trim, we would say replace the batteries in the three card readers because this, this, there were three entrances in this vestibule. We wrote an SOP on that. How do you replace batteries in, in card readers? And we took pictures, detailed accounts, specific set of instructions, because I think your role as a manager of facilities in a team is to be able to effectively do something and then duplicate yourself. So we would then go down and say, inspect condition of doors and kick plates. We wrote an SOP on that. Inspect conditions of wall sconces in the foyer. Wrote an SOP on that. I mean, how to slide up the, the screen that was in there, how to check the, the fitting uh, that was the socket, how to make properly to the wall. Ensure all doors have peoples. Seems ridiculous, but we had an SOP for that. Beeswax, right? Uh, how, to, how to apply it, what to do, what's too thick, what's too thin, does it have any on it? Um, you kind of get the point where we go through and we do this for everything. So we would go say, check and inspect the fireplace. Well, clearly that's very loosely defined here. So what does that mean? We had an SOP for that. How to pull off the, the heat shield, how to take off the glass, how to look at the pilot, how to change the thermal couple. Whatever issue that was going on, we had an SOP for it. Um, so you can imagine, I mean, this was like uh, the, the world's thickest book. I mean, it was something that was just incredible, but so helpful at the end of it. Um, so it's, creating an itemized detailed PM, PM plan is, is so key. Let's see from there, I've shown you the example. Um, and then after you've, you've created the, the itemized PM and mechanical, um, and, you know, we ended up creating like PM daily round. Remember, we'd have to go around. And again, this is the, the less granular version of it, but we would have them circle sheets, perform SOPs on specific items like this. Check out heat exchangers. What's our domestic heat water exchange? What's our temperature? Uh, tank temps, chiller room, status, VFD. And we, we continue on with that. Uh, and again, if anyone of you would like any of these, uh, feel free to, to shoot me an email or let me know. 